Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to Center of Biomedical Ethics. Uh, this is a Writing Pakistan with uh, Omar Shahid Hamid. We're really glad to have him over here with us uh, physically. Uh, just a brief introduction to a center for our online participants, uh, and, uh, and then we will, we will move on uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the session itself. So I'm Swaleha. I work at the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Culture. We have been established since 2004. Uh, we offer postgraduate diploma uh, program in biomedical ethics, along with a master's in bioethics. And uh, over the past several years, we have hel held a lot of ethical and cultural events, have had, a, have had people perform over here, have, ha have invited book authors, etc. Now, post COVID, uh, the dynamics changed and we moved uh, our, uh, our forums, our other events uh, online uh, titled CBEC on the web. So, uh, but we're getting bolder now. Uh, we've ha we have a few people over here uh, and this is our first hybrid uh, session. So we're, and we're really glad that it's with uh, Mr. Umar Shahid Hamid. So for a lot of us, he doesn't need much introduction, but uh, what, what makes Omar Shahid Hamid really interesting is that he's not only an author, which is how I first knew about him, but, uh, but when you read more about him, you find out that he's actually, he's actually been working in the police force for a very long time. And uh, he, uh, he, he has a master's in criminal justice policy from London School of Economics and a master's in law from the University College London. In 2011, he was nominated to receive the Sitare Imtiaz, the highest civil award for gallantry in Pakistan. And as a member of the police force, he has served in Karachi's most dangerous Liari district very nearby during the gang wars. He's also served in Pakistan's intelligence bureau and the Sins Police Counterterrorism Department. And he has been responsible for dozens of successful operations against radical terrorists and has also arrested leading members of the Pakistani Taliban as well as several Al-Qaeda suspects. So, but we're here to we're here to talk more about the books today. And he has written great books, and uh, he's the author of best-selling books, including *The Prisoner*, *The Spinner's Tale*, *The Party Worker*, *The Fix*, and the most recent one, *The Betrayal*. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. So, thank you for having me. Yes. Let's hope that uh, this being your first post-COVID event, it doesn't become a super spreader event. <laughs> Well, all of us are vaccinated. It won't, it won't be my fault. <laughs> no, it won't be my fault either. I just had COVID like two weeks back. So it won't be my fault either. <laughs> yeah, antibodies are good. My antibodies yeah. are good. All right. Okay. So uh, were you a storyteller before you became a writer? Um, that's a very interesting question. You know, I, I never thought of myself as one. Um, Looking back on things now, uh, maybe one thinks that uh, there were some indicators, uh, but I never, I never kind of, because, you know, the writing or creative writing uh, as, as a child in school or in college and all was something that was done by people who were kind of really driven to do this stuff. And I was never, before I became a writer, uh, particularly driven to do this stuff. So I, I don't think I was, but, you know, again, looking back on it, uh, perhaps there were some seeds there uh, along the way. Okay. What about oral storytelling? Uh, oral storytelling. What about oral? Storytelling? You know, I, I think mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was never a storyteller, but I was always a listener. So one of the things that I really used to enjoy doing uh, for instance when i when i started my career was just talking to uh, various colleagues whether they were constables or they were inspectors or whomever and uh, the nature of my job is such that we often have long periods of waiting you know whether it's you sort of standing around uh, looking at a jaloos or at night and before a raid or in the police station or whatever. And so I was certainly a, a story listener. And I, I really, really, I always sort of uh, absorbed all these stories that various people would tell me about Yehua and this happened or that happened. Okay. But a policeman and a writer, it's a very unlikely combination. I mean, very unlikely. Yeah. So what were your motivations to first join the police force and then eventually start writing? 
um <laughs> you know now looking back in my life i could say that the i wanted to become a police officer so that i would become a writer so that one day one of my books would get picked up as a sort of you know marvel franchise film that would earn me like 100 million dollars but probably that's not what is appropriate to be said in uh, a center for bioethics or particularly ethically the uh you know again i think uh the uh, as far as a career in the police is concerned i i i often say this when when people raise this question that uh, it's funny because um we um in fact we were discussing this earlier today we were having a, a conference of the various counter terrorism departments in pakistan and we were saying that the the problem uh, the problem and the and the beauty both ways of, of pakistan is that we don't have strong institutions right so it's very airy fairy if one person comes along they do a good job someone else comes along all of that is is sort of right when and you see examples of this everywhere around us it's not just a matter of the police but in this hospital in the area around us everywhere and but the when you look at it from a public service point of view uh, i mean the the attraction of that is that it means that if you are a public servant with a particular bent of mind uh, your ability to do something uh, or to to kind of actually foment change is far greater than if you were working in an organization that would be institutionally stronger you know so i i uh, i'm sure that for instance a police officer in new york or london or paris is not perhaps as um able to uh, implement change because there are strong systems in place you, know, you follow uh, uh standard operating procedures and and you kind of uh, the system is strong but here because the system is weak uh, it then becomes attractive for people to you know want to do uh, want to work in it uh, of course now a lot of the people more often than not take that as a negative and use it as a negative but it can also be a positive it can be something that encourages people to uh, to sort of join public service yeah. uh so um so you, what you're saying essentially is that uh, politics and uh, systems over here you, it's very person dependent right so it will, it is yeah. yeah yeah so uh but why did you think of becoming a writer i mean did it come very naturally no not at all um again something i stumbled on to um it was um, more than anything i think at the time a cathartic process at a time when for instance i was not particularly uh, happy with what was going on in in my regular career so i just started writing as a way of letting out my frustrations that kind of snowballed into becoming uh, the manuscript for my first book and you know i was lucky enough to get published after that and subsequently of course now i find it addictive so now i need to uh, write uh, you know to keep my balance in life uh, but how do you manage to find the time i mean being a policeman must be very time consuming uh, it is but i think you know um, as i said uh, writing provides a certain balance in life it's my time to myself where i can sort of process things where i can sort of uh you know if i'm again frustrated or uh, embittered by the events around me, it's a world that i can create and go off into so in that sense um i find it very liberating now and i always try and make the time not try i always succeed in making the time for it yeah because i i read that your first book was written when you were on a sabbatical right mm -hmm. so how has it been in the in the recent years i mean uh... you know not bad um the first three books in fact i wrote while i was in sabbatical in the uk i was still working there but obviously the, my uh, work over there was not as strenuous or uh, all consuming as as my job over here uh, now uh, it's been i think two books since i've come back and i had always thought that it would be difficult uh, managing the two things but actually so far it's worked out so not bad so just a connected question and then i'll i have i see dr amir like raising his hand very furiously so just just give me a minute so did you actually attend any uh, creative writing classes because you said that you weren't really writing uh... i did not oh okay i okay. did not and i'll just add a point to that 
you know i think um from what i've seen oftentimes um i have many friends and colleagues who have sort of gone down that a path and perhaps there are people over here who who followed that uh, path i personally find that it kind of acts as a negative because i think you the environment that you have for these sorts of creative writing courses is that essentially it's a gladiatorial contest where people are put in a room and uh, a teacher or an expert starts by tearing you apart you know it's it's sort of like defending your phd thesis and i think you need to have a lot of kind of will power and strength of character to survive that and i've actually seen a number of friends not survive it in the sense that you know they've written something but the element of self doubt creeps in is this good enough you know is this the sort of thing that anyone will would like to read i don't think so you know my 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 supervisor or whomever doesn't think so and i think um i mean you know if you haven't i'm sure that it, it's uh, it's very good at honing writing skills and all that but i think if you don't have that pressure that monkey on your back it's just easier right i mean i could have written absolute rubbish but sometimes having the sort of self confidence to write rubbish and then put it out there is good because sometimes it works i can relate to that as a, as a researcher and as an academic writer uh, dr <clears throat> amir yeah uh, so you belong to your profession is a very rough and tough profession yeah um which um, and which you have to conform to i'm sure in your uh, in your wardi you are different uh, it's a different environment like uh, 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 perhaps you blend in i'm not sure but i i would imagine that in your uh, work environment in your uh, investigations or your actual uh, field work etc you are as you conform to the image that we have of a policeman whereas a writer is a person who's got a cup of tea over here and a perhaps not i will not mention a cigarette no i will not mention a cigarette this is a center of attention you just you just yeah. did yeah <laughs> and, and, and you have this environment in which you got <clears throat> books you know you got your peace and quiet and etc etc so they are very very different worlds but you managed of course and you're a success story in that however how do you uh, how does this image of yours as a writer and and a person who who's a thinker uh can uh, fit in with your colleagues and their relationship with you as a professional in a very rough and tough uh, profession you know i my um belief and and what i've sort of seen is has been that the two things or rather the thing that uh, a writer and a police officer has in common is that they are both keen observers of the society that they live in all police officers are that whether good or bad because uh, policing is a profession that is at such a crossroads of society that um, they have to be very good sort of uh, students of human nature and writers are the same you know uh, so i think in that sense while on a kind of more obvious level uh, you may not be able to see a lot of uh, commonality but i do think that uh, this aspect of both of them being keen observers and keen students of human nature uh, that's very crucial i mean i i am i mean you're absolutely right that there aren't a lot of writers who are police officers not just in pakistan but the world over but uh, often i think why not because actually the insight that a police officer has on the society that he lives in is very very interesting i found that that that's always been my kind of take on it uh very yeah uh, okay so i have a connected question to this uh, uh i have a social sciences background so when we study in sociology about the bureaucratic structure and what impact it has on uh, hu uh, human life uh, we study that uh, bureaucratic structure uh, creates a human being uh, which is a very hardcore rationalist and he's uh, caged in a, a iron cage of rationality as max weber said so uh, in such a situation the creativity uh, is dead as we assume social scientists or sociologists we assume so how 
can creativity come out of uh, such a rationalist observation of a policeman? Um, well, I mean, you know, uh, if you look at examples, both from within Pakistan and from around the world, you actually find that a lot of um, bureaucrats or civil servants have been writers and fairly successful writers. Um, not necessarily police officers, but uh, even if you look at uh, around the world, George Orwell was a policeman, for instance. Um, again, I, what I'll say is that the the sort of strange uh, crossroads that that policing uh, sits at is that yes, it is by nature a very um, bureaucratic organization. I mean, it's a uniformed force, right? So it doesn't get more bureaucratic or standardized than that. But at the same time, the nature of the job is such that you will face new situations on a daily basis, you will face humanity at its worst and at its best. You will see that and you will see that every single day. Uh, and so you know, you can't despite whatever sort of uh, structural impediments that uh, that there may be uh, you can't uh, say that uh, you know they you can't sort of get away from this very sort of uh, symbiotic relationship uh yeah mr nika so um just going back to something that was said earlier about how you find time for writing so i had it, this you could give a yes or no answer to this but it would be nice if you would elaborate a little bit do you think that if you were a woman you would have the same kind of time for writing you know because you're able to you said you're able to make time for writing do you think your gender you know, has this this is a question that? that's better addressed to my wife <laughs> uh but uh, you're absolutely right you know um and i will uh, i will say this that especially uh, as far as my wife is concerned she's always been someone who has uh, given me that time uh, i won't say without recriminations but with a minimal uh, amount of recrimination but you're right uh, you know it's uh, not perhaps almost certainly uh, let me put it another way i think if i were if i were a woman i would probably have to work thrice as hard to make the time for myself to write uh, that is a, an unfortunate uh, reality uh, that that's correct yeah yes dr ali please, please uh, send a recording of this session to my wife <laughs> so that there is, there is you know all of you are witnesses that i praised her and uh, you know i'm so uh, She'll fall, she'll know your tricks. You know that. Yeah, right? I'm, I'm Dr. Ali. Uh, uh, one policeman uh, once told me, Dr. Sal, there's very little difference between you and us. You know, if you uh, examine it, uh, the hospitals have security guards, uh, entrances are guarded, the doctors wear a different uniform, the patients. Uh, they have a separate uniform, there are visiting hours, meal times, restrictions. Same thing happens with prisoners in the jail. Um, so working as a doctor and as a policeman, as a doctor, I feel less sensitive um, to death and disease, sufferings, because I always compared uh, with someone who's suffering more, minor headaches. If someone is crying with those pains, I would just, you know, I would feel irritated. You have not seen exact the actual pain. Similarly, when you as a writer, as a sensitive person who is trying to observe and collect these feelings from the criminal elements, um, are you do you feel insensitive to minor crimes then like us you know the, that's a very good question and i think there is a tendency uh, that police officers have in common with doctors that we become desensitized to the kind of human suffering around us because you are you know seeing that every day um, 
I remember at one point I uh, I had been uh, in the counterterrorism department and I got posted uh, as the SSP of uh, South, which is which is this area and you know includes parts of the city like Clifton or Defence and and over there obviously you know I went from sort of chasing Al Qaeda and you know is there a suicide bomber in the city or not to you know my masi has run away and there was you know i there were several times where i had to stop myself i mean uh, because there is that i think and, and i i think you know what i will say is that for doctors and i could be wrong here and and maybe this is certainly a better question for you you have to remain desensitized because that's the job right you have to look at it as an abstract problem i think for for police officers um if you lose that empathy you cannot be a good police so yes you you need to have a degree of desensitization you you can't fall to pieces the first time that you visit a, a, a murder scene or a bomb blast site or whatever but at the same time if you have no empathy if you become so hardened uh, and i think this is a problem that a lot of police officers have Uh, if you become hardened to the point that you have no empathy, I think that you cannot do your job as well as you should do. Yeah, so I think we have a couple of questions online as well, and we can just take those because we don't want to risk losing our online participants who are joining from all over the world. Actually, I see a couple from Dubai, London, and Zurich, and Kenya. Uh, Kenya. So yeah. So, but you can uh, could you read out the questions? Please? Yeah, Thank the you. The first question is from Gul Roksar Mujahid. Uh, she asked that uh, why would you choose fiction instead of non-fiction, as we see a lot of soldiers and scholars indulging in. What is uh, was it a personal preference? The the simple answer to that is sales. You cannot match. You can write the best uh, non-fiction, you know, study on policing or crime or politics, and you cannot match. the sales of a you know best selling novel i also think that uh, you know fiction in a lighter way well we we think it's a lighter way because it's it's fiction right but in fact many deep truths are often uh, said much easily much more easily in uh, in fiction writing and uh, you can i think um, kind of really sketch the how should i put this this the sort of that particular zeitgeist of a society as a fiction writer in a way that maybe you cannot do of course it's a matter of a much bigger audience but you know i think fiction writers are able and all, always have been able through history to capture a particular society and with all its you know sort of uh, contradictions and and whatever far far better than any kind of uh, non fiction uh, you know report or book would be able to do uh another question from faiza harun uh, just a second farid i have a follow up question to this okay. and then you can perhaps take one so okay. i mean yes uh, on that note your books are regarded as fiction but as a reader it is easy to see that you know there are realities of karachi and pakistan politics within them i mean it's very clear who the don is for instance and what which city when you talk about new york which city you're referring to so how has that been what was the reception over there i mean i'm really interested i um haven't had any issues so far uh <laughs> i i remember when i was uh, starting out in my first book i was joking with a a colleague i was on sabbatical and i was speaking to a colleague uh, who was in karachi in the police and i said yeah you know i must find a way i hope this book becomes a best seller and he said uh, not a problem we'll uh, get uh, about 20 30 people to walk down mh jinnah road and uh, you know shouting that uh, this book is uh, should be banned and we'll burn a couple of copies of it and it will sell off the the shelves so i think uh, uh, not that we ever did that uh, although if my sales go down maybe perhaps it's still an idea for the future but uh i think you know the the, the success of the books uh, has been in uh, in that um uh, that you know it kind of people who read it we we were talking earlier that when you read it you kind of get the taste and the feel of of karachi as it is and as we live in it um so yeah i mean so far so good 
So it is a follow up for yeah. that particular. I also have, yeah. But go ahead. Okay, so this is the this is a going on now. Popular question. Yeah, yeah, it is about because you know it, it resonates with a lot of Karachi of all of us, with all of us. So you said you you had no problems, but you said that very <clears throat> casually. Were you able to get away with writing what you wrote because of your position in the pol pol in the police hierarchy, or? Would it be, uh, would, would, it, would it not, did that not have an impact on? I don't think so. I mean, um, you know, honestly speaking, uh, if we, if we are very, very open about it, I mean, I've written, for instance, about the rise of fascistic political parties like the MQM uh, and the MQM. And, and I wrote about it when the MQM was still at its peak. Uh I don't think, and because, uh, and leave alone police officers who were writing against them. I mean, the MQM had uh, had a history of murdering police officers across the city. So I don't think that they had any particular kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, regard for the fact that I could have been a police officer or not. Um, and I think the, the other element is that some people have raised the point of, you know, uh, me mentioning or talking about the establishment or the deep state, which is the other side of it. Yeah. And uh, again, um, I have not uh, ever had uh, an issue. In fact, I have, I work oftentimes within the intelligence community. Um, I very closely with um, a cross section of agencies and, and bodies and all that. And overwhelmingly, uh, you know, they've all, I've always found uh, that they've been, they've enjoyed the books. They've been fans of the books. Uh, so no, no complaints on, on that uh, regard, in that regard. And I think you kind of, it's just a comment. Did you, uh, well, question two, did you think that you actually got away with that and you know, that people enjoy your books because they're, uh, they're, uh, they're under fiction and if it, I, mean... I think, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of things. Yes. Of course, you can say a lot of things in fiction that you can't say um, in nonfiction, uh, because obviously, if, for instance, I were to write a nonfiction account of the history of Karachi over, say, the last 40 years, I would have to vet that uh, very carefully and kind of, you know, uh, it would go through an entire screening process so as to ensure that I wasn't defaming or libeling anyone. So that would obviously be a lot tougher. So I think uh, you're able to uh, write a lot more as, uh, and I, that also goes back to the earlier point of fiction being a much wider audience. So you're able to say things that you would otherwise not be able to say. And um, uh, sorry, what was this? What is the second part of your question? No, that was actually it, uh, 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 Farid. Uh, uh, okay, it? so uh, I would narrate the question from online. Uh, Faiza Harun. Uh, was asking, uh, I think it was a connected question from a previous question uh, where you mentioned George Orwell as a policeman in writing. So she's asking uh, if there are other policemen uh, writing, why aren't more policemen inclined towards writing? We would love to read more of insights by more cops. You know, that that's uh, a very good question. And I said earlier that I'm surprised that uh, there aren't more policemen writers uh, recently, last year, I was contacted by uh, a police officer from somewhere in the US and uh, who told me that there was an association of policemen who write novels. I thought that was fantastic. And uh, they were supposedly putting together a, a selection of short stories from policemen all over the world. I think, um, you know, policing is a hard profession um, and it takes a lot out of you. I think you kind of also going back to your point of decent being becoming desensitized. Uh, you kind of really have to work hard to maintain that level of um, uh, what's the word for it? perception or kind of you know uh, being able to take a step back and and taking uh, things in. So I think that's why you don't find uh, more policemen who are writers. And uh, Judith, uh, a fellow from Kenya, she has uh, written a question, but I would like her to speak for a question because it is a complicated one. Uh, Judith, can you uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah. yeah, she has a video. Uh, you, you are muted. Can you please unmute yourself? 
Thank you. It was on the issue of trying to write and maybe going to seasoned trainers who may end up killing your dream of writing by thinking like your writing is not up to standard. So in my view, it's like uh, you tend to work with them, but to some degree, maybe they don't control you. So I was like, how do you balance the relationship with such people so that you can actually benefit from them without them killing your dream of uh, a publication? Yeah. Um... You know, uh, Judith, the thing is that you, uh, I think that when you, my point was that when you kind of, uh, you know, uh, get involved in an organized study program like creative writing, so if you're doing a master's in it or a diploma in it, uh, that's where, <laughs> sorry, <clears throat> can I get some water? Yeah. Uh, that's where these uh, issues come up. Um, you know, there is, uh, you, that doesn't mean that you can't, learn from people informally uh you know i've learned a lot just from talking to other writers from around the world uh just you know how they perfect their craft how the different things they do the different sort of tools that they use uh to kind of you know narrate a tale i think there's there's absolutely i mean you know there, there's tremendous learning to be done in that the only problem as i said is that when it's in my experience when it has come in, in this very organized packaged way as a degree course, where essentially you're competing against others, uh, then I don't know, you know, I'm not convinced about the, um, you know, about the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, but um, don't you think that it's always you know, good to be groomed uh, in whatever your passion is or whatever you're doing? Because uh, that's what we tell our kids. Because there's there's a raw talent, and then you get you get yourself groomed in that. So it's like this, right? I mean, I would say that uh, writing is like playing a sport. Uh, if you have the talent, uh, I mean, I I wasn't groomed in it. Uh, I kind of started writing, and I feel that every book that I've written there's an improve which comes with experience right so you know it's uh, to to take an example from say cricket if you're a young very talented batsman you have the talent and then the more you play the more experience you become in how to play in different conditions um you know th th there's an element of seasoning that that comes into it i i don't think uh, that writing in particular is a thing where you need to be groomed under a kind of formal structure you know it, it's one of those professions where i don't think that you need to have a formal structure i mean you there is no guarantee that you will be a better writer if you have a phd in creative writing from oxford or cambridge or wherever there's no guarantee of that and you're kind of like a testament for that so <laughs> okay uh do we have any more okay all right uh this is a question from my uh, myself so uh, it is related to your writings uh, uh, usually when we read literature or we see movies uh, these kind of thriller or suspense movies uh, we usually see uh, some kind of protagonist and there's some kind of antagonist a hero and then a villain and in the end the hero wins but uh, in your stories uh, there are no uh, separate entities of villains or heroes. I, I find all things gray. Uh, why uh, is it something uh, specific in your mind that you keep in your stories? Um, you know, exactly that, that I think that the world uh, is different shades of gray. And uh, there are very few occasions in life where you have absolute right and absolute wrong most of the times we lie between those uh, those absolutes and i think as a writer uh, i have found for instance that it has always been far more interesting to write about flawed or create flawed characters i i personally feel that you know if i were to write about perfect characters who were morally perfect and you know in every in every form of the, uh, form uh, they'd be boring characters 
So I, I always think that the, the morally flawed character is far more interesting. Okay. And, and this is uh, this question is sort of connected to Farid's question. So thanks for raising that, Farid. So many writers actually uh, portray certain autobiographical details in their novels, right? And Not me. Yeah? Not me. Not you? Not me. So would you not then say that it is true for some of the ca uh, characters in your book at all? I mean, some people from your life, perhaps? You know, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to portray other people uh, or, you know, to kind of base characters on other people. I think it's a lot more difficult uh, and you need a far greater degree of self-analysis to be able to portray yourself. You can, caric you can caricature yourself by sort of showing yourself as a, you know, sort of a knight in shining armor. But, you know, that's, that's a, again, as I said, as a boring character. And so I, I don't think that I, as a writer, have the skill to kind of portray myself. And so I, I actually, many people have asked me this question that, oh, uh, which one of your characters is based on you? And I've always said, and, and truthfully, that none. They've been, they've been based on other people, on colleagues or, or you know, uh, people from the media or whatever, but not on myself. Uh, Farid, do you have a question? Yeah, go for it. Uh, another connected <laughs> question. So uh, when you say that you are not part of your stories in, in form of uh, bi biographical, uh, a little uh, ago you said that uh, writing has now become liberating for you or some uh, or like other people say that it's kind of therapeutic for me or it's acting like a psychoanalysis for me. Yeah. So isn't any kind of catharsis or any kind of other such thing involved in your writing in which you are uh, reflecting on your experiences? Absolutely. Look, the, the catharsis is there. Uh, that's absolutely there. It helps me, I think, to deal with times of stress. It helps me to, you know, sort of balance out stress and sort of, concerns about work or family or whatever so it's that middle ground uh, which is able to fine tune my internal uh, mechanism uh, and it helps me to process things that I have seen or come across but that doesn't necessarily mean that those things have happened to me or or that it's self-processing but it just helps me to process okay you know um, to give you an example, this whole thing of, of match fixing in cricket, right? Well, I was a, uh, I am a, a cricket fan and this story was always interesting, but writing a book about match fixing helped me to process the kind of drama uh, from the point of view of a fan of, you know, sort of having these icons and idols whom you worship as heroes and then seeing them fall and then having the issue of self-doubt that, oh, you know, every time I'm turning on the TV, are these, is this fixed? Is this not, what if is what I'm seeing not true? Uh, it helped, you know, th there was a lot of the, that, uh, for lack of a better word, trauma uh, over, over a number of years, just as a, as a, as a fan. And I think it writing a book about it helped me to process and to kind of make sense of a lot of that. So while we are on the subject of match fixing, um, while you were researching the fix, uh, which I, took, I actually I was reading um, while the World Cup was going on, and every no ball I was suspecting now, I and mean, this was just basically terrible. So that's a different story. But while you were uh, uh, researching it, you came across. Clearly, things that were wrong, um, bookies were, you were, people were involved in all sorts of things. And you were in a position, as you were, of course, a, a researcher at that time, wearing the researcher's hat. But you're also, the other hat is that of a policeman. So did you have a moral uh, conflict uh, at that time that I am researching things and these are things that I've identified as wrong and a person I know is a, 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 either a criminal right now or is going to do something criminal, yet I'm just going to take information and write my book and not act upon it. Because this is a question we ask researchers a lot of time. If you look at, I mean, you know, uh, you gave the example of uh, cricket fixing, but if you look at all of my books, they have a degree of moral ambiguity to them. And that moral ambiguity is the bit that I find interesting. Um, I have come across uh, whether it was match fixers, whether it was policemen who had 
been involved in extrajudicial killings, whether it was criminals who had you know committed great crime. I've come across all sorts of these uh, characters. I have uh, in the course of my professional life. Uh, most of the time, uh, in fact, you know, uh, uh, I would say all of the time, except for the um, for the fixing, the, the match fixing thing, I dealt with them from a professional point of view. But while I was sort of dealing with them uh, in a professional space, learning my curiosity uh, was piqued by by their experiences, by their motivations. And so, it you know, I learned a lot. Uh, a lot more than just what was written in a file or in an FIR about those people. Uh, about the, uh, as far as the the sort of bookies were concerned, uh, I had again uh, come across them in a professional uh, capacity. I had arrested uh, several of them in the past. Subsequently, uh, when they got bailed out, uh, you know, uh, I was able to speak to them again. Some, uh, I did approach some with a very researcher's hat on. And as we were discussing earlier, under, I suppose, the bookies equivalent of Chatham House rules, where it was, you know, whatever you ascribe to me cannot be ascribed uh, out of this context. So um, there was that. Um, you know, is it ethically appropriate? Um no, it's 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 a story of human nature, right? Uh, writing about a bookie doesn't mean that I'm more likely to let him go next time that he kind of uh, breaks the law. But sitting with him and uh, or with a terrorist, for instance, and talking about and learning about their personal life story is uh, I think also makes me a better professional in the long term and uh, you know makes me a better well it makes me a more interesting writer but it certainly makes me a better professional because it means that I have uh, greater insight into into these issues uh, but, but I have a follow-up question to what Dr. Amir was uh, asking that uh, I mean so it, so I mean I think as a researcher we give like this example that if you stumble so if you're investigating something for in an orphanage, for instance, and you stumble upon child abuse, do you act there and then? Because so as, as a writer, when you were researching for your books and you found, uncovered something criminal, were, were I think you... it, it wasn't, uh, I mean, um, the stuff that I've written about was already, as I said, in with the case of the bookies, as well, they were mostly, uh, in fact, all of them were people who had been arrested previously, right? So it's not it's not the same example as uncovering, let's say, a child abuse scandal in an orphanage uh, mm. inadvertently. If you have a situation like that, you absolutely have a duty yeah. uh, to do that. Yeah. Uh, this is more kind of, you know, uh, if a terrorist or a bookie was under arrest or whatever, or a police officer who had uh, broken the law, it's about talking to them. Oh, in the okay. course of your professional discourse, talking to them, learning from them. So some of your investigations would then sort of impact your book and, and, and the narratives within the book. Well, uh, I don't know if the investigation would impact the books, but certainly the personal stories, hmm. you know, when you, when you come to, let's say, sketching a character, right? And you're saying, okay, I want to sketch this character. What, what are this? One of, one of the exercises that I, I uh, do is I try and sketch the motivations of a character. Okay, why is he or she, why would he or she do this? You know, why, what are their motivations? It's not enough to say, oh, just because they're bad. Nobody is bad. Well, some people are, but uh, it's always driven by something, right? It's driven by some element of human nature. And that aspect uh, was the bit uh, that I found interesting. You know, I mean, um, a lot of people spoke about The Prisoner, which is my first book, about how it portrays police officers. It does not portray police officers in a good light or a bad light. Uh, it portrays police officers in a very, uh, what I would like to believe is a realistic light. Uh, and I think that that uh, is the bit where I don't think that necessarily is an ethical issue. It's it's sort of writing what you see. Yeah, and, and I think... Uh... Uh, it, it it really is all about kind of exploring the innate 
human nature and understanding that no one's really a villain or a hero to say and there are sh- there are bad stuff in all of us and good stuff in in all of us right uh farid you have a connected question yeah okay i have a question related to ethics yeah okay. so uh you might have a personal moral compass on which you judge uh, what is right and wrong for you so as you write uh, more and more books you get uh, reactions or uh, recommendations or criticism on your books has uh, that feedback on your writings affected your own moral compass in any way um that's an interesting question i don't think so but i think a lot of these things are often times kind of under the surface so sometimes you may not realize that you but you know some whether it's feedback or criticism or whatever some of that to a degree sink especially when it comes to issues of a personal moral compass perhaps at some point you find that it seeps into your personality but you know i haven't seen any overt signs of it but i think that's that's a very fair question that uh, perhaps there is an element there over time a, a very follow up sorry <laughs> to interrupt you again go ahead kari sorry so uh, a very related thing uh, is that uh, there has been a debate uh, while uh, in art in literature in these kind of writings that uh, art is something that is uh, transcendent to uh, some kind of motives or some purpose or goal art is something in itself a beautification so what do you believe in in which side of uh, this debate are you you know i mean you have uh, artists sitting here who would probably be able to answer this question far better than me my point uh, of view has always been that you know i am a storyteller in fact i kind of don't even say that i am a writer i am a storyteller people will take away from those stories what i can never predict how you or anyone sitting here will you know what they'll take away from my stories i can't predict that uh, i can't control that and i shouldn't control that you know it should be uh, everyone each to his own my job is just to kind of put out those stories which i think are interesting stories and which i would like to share with a wider audience so i i try and keep it very simple uh, shaheen can answer that yeah, as she's the like artist to add to that uh, as an artist i think the biggest misconception about art is that it is for the purpose of beautification because when an artist creates a work of art that is not the intention however that is the perception of the artist and the storytelling of that particular artist uh while i say that um art the beauty of art is that it is open to interpretation like you said every viewer every uh, person who connects to that work of art be it a writing they will connect to it with their own personal experiences and and maybe understand it in their own way it's not necessary that it comes together as one understanding or one story but it is multiple stories and multiple understandings and perceptions of the work itself so yeah yeah but i think farid was leaning towards more the differentiation between the art and the craft so you're doing art as it is rather than art having an instrumental value right yeah, uh, yeah. for example the uh, the progressive writing aiming at a, at something yeah i mean so so, so radically i have never aimed at anything other than telling a good story <laughs> yeah. we, we also have an uh, another online question from sharmin and she wants okay shamin uh, can you unmute yourself and your uh, video and ask her yourself yeah no i i can't unmute my video uh, because <laughs> i'm not in a in a good okay, place okay. right now in terms of uh, i'm i'm in a very crowded hall but i did want to ask um, your own favorite book actually i just was very curious because you know um i know that um, uh mohammed hanif uh, t- talks about catch 22 as an in- as an inspiration occasionally uh what about you do you have one favorite book that you just absolutely love i don't um uh, you know i i tend to read a lot across the spectrum i i'll read all sorts of stuff you know if you look at my bedside reading on any average day it'll be ve- you know it'll be very sort of uh, it's a cross section of stuff i've never had like one fav- there are books that i've enjoyed at a particular time in life those books that have mattered to me 
because of wherever I was at that particular time in life. But I can't say that I have necessarily a favorite book, one book, no. How about characters? Because there are some characters that are already have longer lives. So somebody started in the prison is also in, the, in betrayal. So some of your characters, of course, they're fitting into the story. But uh, is there something about that character that you like? or is this, this is a... I think um, there are uh, some characters that I um, kind of created that I thought that it would be a waste to throw them away after just one book. You know, so uh, I, I do, uh, you know, I, I think they were just uh, such good characters and uh, worthy of much greater uh, exploration that I, you know, I wanted to reintroduce them. Um, Fareed, do you have a question online? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Inayatullah Mehman would like to ask something and uh, he will ask himself. <coughs> Mr. Omar Hamid Shah, around you there are many people, uh, high police officials, politicians, and also other very powerful people. You being a very fine person, I mean the writer, how do you reconcile those pressures and to be honest with them? I mean, honest with your profession and with the integrity. Um, as I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite, uh, I, as I understood the question, the question is that how do I reconcile the realities of uh, the sort of working environment that I have with my personal uh, moral compass. That, that's the question, right? As, roughly as I answer. Yes. Um, yes, and, also, and also with your higher officials and the political persons who, who praise you for some undue or unfair purposes. I think uh, this is a job, uh, policing, not writing where your moral compass is tested on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure there are times when uh, I would have failed that as uh, have all police. Officers, and there are times where I would have passed that. At the end of the day, it's, uh, I think the, a very easy metric for it is that, can you go home and sleep soundly at night? Uh, thinking back that, you know, whatever you've done in, in a, on a given day has not kind of like been against uh, your uh, principles or your moral compass. And that, that's certainly the yardstick that I, I try and use. That's not to say that I don't know. I mean, whether that will always be that way or not, uh, because as I said, it's always um, an ongoing battle. Uh, but I think that I have, you know, my sleep, over 20 years has been pretty decent. Yeah, for you. Uh, uh, it's another question from me. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you ever considered writing in Urdu because the population you are targeting in Pakistan uh, is a very minority who reads English novels, but the majority who can read Urdu uh, and we don't find any such thing in Urdu who can openly target uh, such figures <clears throat> which you have targeted couple of things. First of all, I haven't targeted any figures. Uh, you nor, have written about no, them. So. I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, nor have I kind of targeted any particular audience. I have, as I said, I write whatever I think is a good story. Uh, you know, I have felt that writing a story about Karachi's political parties was a good story, something that I wanted to read, so I wrote about it. I thought that writing about match fixing in cricket was a good story to be told, so I wrote about it. In the future, I might think that, you know, writing about a clown's life might be an interesting story. So I might, I might write that. So it's, um, for me, it's, it's, it's about kind of, it's not about targeting a particular, particular audience and all. The other thing is that, look, I write in what I know, right? I, I write in English because that's the language in terms of writing that I'm comfortable in. Maybe if I was an oral historian, I would be far more proficient in Urdu. Having said that, so I don't think that writing for me, writing in Urdu was ever an option. Having said that, 
uh, you're absolutely right that, you know, I have over the years uh, seen that there has been a lot of interest in uh, my books being reproduced uh, in Urdu or being translated in Urdu. And, uh, you know, I've always said that if anyone was interested in doing that, I was happy for them to kind of come forward and, you know, work out an ar- arrangement with me. And uh, you will be happy to know that uh, The Prisoner is currently being translated. And I think, you know, it's, it's, I'm really looking forward to that translation because, uh, as you said, it will open up this book uh, to a much wider, uh, much more varied uh, sort of group. And uh, I'm, you know, uh, I'm very interested in seeing what their reaction will be. Okay. And actually, uh, we're waiting for the Netflix adaptation of The Party Worker. <laughs> so when is that going to be? Do you have? Um, I think the, uh, the Party Worker, they haven't made a lot of headway on yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I keep telling uh, the, the team that, that bought the party work, they, they haven't sort of, that they have a limited number of years and if they haven't made anything, then the rights will revert back to me. Uh, but the prisoner, I think they've made uh, quite a bit of headway on. Um, they obviously, because of the pandemic and issues like that, they've been, uh, their schedules and all have been delayed. But uh, from what I last sort of gathered, uh, it should be, they should start filming sometime in the new year. Uh, Hopefully, you know, with the post-production cycle or whatever, it will probably come out on some streaming service, maybe Netflix, maybe some other, by the second half of next year. Fingers crossed. Super. But have you contributed at all to the screenplay? Um, not to the screenplay because I don't, you know, I don't think I have the skill to be a screenwriter, uh, but I have, you know, I've, I've discussed, uh, the, the book conceptually and I am, I keep helping out the, the production team in terms of, you know, we have discussions of, okay, if we do a scene like this, what would it look like? What should Urangi police station look like? What would, you know, this person, how would he, what sort of language would he use? These sorts of things. So more as a kind of a technical consultant mm. rather than a, a screenwriter. Mm. Okay. So since we're close to six actually, but we'll just take one question from Dr. Ali and then I have one last final question. <laughs> Once I had heard uh, Muhammad Hanif saying that after finishing a book, he lives with those characters for some time and it is till he creates other ones and uh, you know, create some more and he writes some more. When you write about these uh, characters like the prisoners or the bookkeepers, or, do they haunt you in the sleep? They, when you have created them, you've to- told a story about them and you always had thoughts about how they would have reacted. And Good question. I would say uh, to Hanif that he needs to get out more and meet more people. Uh, you know, I uh, obviously he has his own process and he's a fantastic writer. Uh, no, the, the simple and, and the reason for that is that I have a tendency that I will write a story uh, and I'll be very involved with, with that story while I'm writing it. But once it's done and dusted and finished, then I have a tendency to move on to the next thing. You know, say if I've written a book on on match fixing and cricket, I'm very involved with, with that while I'm writing. And I'm thinking about it constantly, even on days that I'm not writing, but I'm thinking about the characters and those sorts of things. But once that book is completed and out there, then I tend to kind of move on to the next thing. You know, uh, I don't tend to, uh, there are some characters, as I said, who kind of have, just because they were so interesting, I've always kept uh, in a box in the back of my head saying oh this is a character that i used in this this book he's he or she uh, really should be used again at some point in life but uh, but no i the characters don't haunt me no two questions uh, which uh, which of your own book is your favorite book i mean i know that uh, sharmeen asked about uh, your favorite book from other but which one would you would you personally consider as your favorite from among the five books that you, uh, you know, that's like saying which of your kids is your favorite kid um, <laughs> you know again it's uh, for me um, uh, each of the books represents a different point in my life and so they each book is special for 
for a particular reason or reasons because of the time period that they represent. Um, and I think as I sitting where I do, uh, I see a kind of transition uh, in each book. Uh, that's uh, as I see it, a maturing of myself as a person, as a writer. Uh, but no, I don't have a favorite as such. No. So is another book in the works? I think that's a- yes. Yes. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the the simple answer is yes yeah and when can we expect uh you know it's uh it's early days but uh, but i have started writing and again uh, i tend to move around topics so i think uh, you know again i'm sort of taking a topic that i haven't really done in the past which is this very interesting um you know it's about the rise of right wing uh feeling or kind of right wing uh politicians around the world you know whether it's in democratic countries or uh, quasi democratic countries and it sort of looks at this phenomenon uh through the eyes of a set of characters uh of you know how and why these sorts of things are happening in countries as diverse culturally as say the US and Pakistan so very different countries very different socio cultural dynamics but very similar phenomena happening at the same time so uh, yeah yeah i mean you had uh, yeah. Pasha, i, I would not put that on the on the blurb because that sounds like a very boring book <laughs> i'm sure i'll sort of find a much shorter and much more interesting blurb for it uh, so i know you we have no doubt about that, that. <laughs> at the end of the um, uh, point, but i wanted just one follow up yeah, fine because for, as a person who desires to write but has no ability to do so <laughs> um and being a uh, such a busy person do you do you write do you type um then do you have a designated target of words words or pages or duration that you will spend doing this or is just just amad hoti hai yeah what's your writing process yeah you know it's i think um it is important to uh, because a lot of people face this problem that they start writing and then they say that oh we didn't have time for it or they feel that no you know i'll only write when something could sort of comes to me and i think part of the discipline of it is that you need to you won't always be able to do it but you need to kind of chalk out some time and say okay it doesn't matter but this is one hour or two hours uh where i will attempt to put something on on screen i mean you know i i type so i don't uh, it's not on a piece of paper but uh, and maybe in those 2 hours you won't be productive at all and maybe in those 2 hours you will end up writing 10000 words i've happened you know both situations have have happened to me i don't start out with a quota uh but you know i i do think that it's important to actually sit down and go through that process because uh, we tend to kind of then say ki, oh forget it you know it's not coming i'll put it aside and and that's where i think a lot of uh, good books are just left by the wayside okay so we're kind of done with our questions as we near the end of the session so uh, a final call more questions no okay super thank you so much uh, for coming here it has been lovely chatting with you thank and, you yeah. it's been a pleasure being here thank you so much it was actually uh, also a very good uh, uh, experience for our students over here also we uh, that we were able to chat with you so that uh, because we use so many teaching modalities and a book is an excellent teacher in so many ways uh, the stories and the layers within it and every segment of that so i think this was an excellent uh, addition to our bio six pedagogy workshop that is going on right now so thanks a lot thank you very much for your time thank you yeah thank you so much everyone those who have joined online those who, those who stayed back after a very long day so thanks a lot thank you i enjoyed it and i see dr amar jasani from india as well so i didn't mention that in in, in the countries i initially was so thanks dr amar well i joined very late yeah okay thank you <laughs>